Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to CERS live stream event, the future of ETS, rescoping, and its effects. My name is Maximo Micinilli. I'm the Energy and Climate Director at the Center on Regulation in Europe, and I'm more than pleased to moderate a two-panel debate around our new study dealing with the feasibility of the UTS scope extension and how to manage the potential effects. This is a very timely discussion for those following the recent developments of the Ukraine Green Deal and the so-called Fit for 55 package, which will see a number of legislative proposals in June. In this context, the UTS has been the backbone of the efforts to reduce emissions for many years, but climate ambitions are now set at different level and speed. The upcoming reform of the UTS may include the extension of the scope to critical sectors such as maritime shipping, road transport, heating, which would reshape the landscape of EU tools and policies to reach climate targets. It is also timely because of the context. The CO2 price is peaking at its historical levels, almost 40 euros this week. China has relaunched a sort of federal ETS for the first time. A carbon border adjustment mechanism is being discussed to reinforce the carbon leakage regime in what it seems a new carbon era for the EU. All of that is unfolding in the context of the most severe pandemic of the last century. I'm sure we are all curious to hear the key findings of CER independent academic report in two panel sessions. A first one on the feasibility of the extension to transport and heating, and a second panel uh, about the impacts and how to manage distributional effects. For that, we have invited our authors and several experts uh, coming from the European Commission, the unions, consumer associations, and environmental organizations to react and debate. And of course, we want all the audiences to participate via Slido. 
please use the HR code or go to the Slido website and type the hashtag ETSSER to enter into the debate room. Type your questions and comments anytime, please don't be shy. And you can also use Twitter to share your thoughts with the same hashtag. Now, before we start the panel one, I'd like to show you um, one of the results of the online survey that we have, that we have uh, launched this week. So um, I'm sharing this screen and the question, the first question we asked was, do you think that the EU emissions trading system should extend it to road transport and buildings and heating? And the answers, as you can see, is pretty polarized. 45% said that, yes, the extension should be taken place. 42% they say no. And 10% uh, said only road transport and only 3% only buildings and heating. So I hope that this result will help us to uh, understand and to discuss during this debate uh, what kind of options we have to do so. Now, um, I would like to give the floor now to uh, Beatrice Jordi for a quick set the scene introduction. Beatrice is director at DG Clima, responsible for European and international carbon markets. And I would like to thank you, Beatrice, for the invitation. I know this is a very intense and very, uh, uh, I would say, busy weeks for you and for your teams. Now, could you please tell us about the context of the UTS reform, why this reform is so important, and particularly which stage you are on the potential extensions to other sectors? Many times, uh, Massimo, I hope uh, sound is okay and you can hear me well, super. So a pleasure to be with you. It's, uh, it's a timely uh, point of the possible extension of ETS. It's, uh, we need independent academic uh, studies. We need uh, your voices to do uh, the best uh, out of uh, this uh, exercise. And uh, just let me uh, explain you. There has been a, a change of league. I mean, the, the Green Deal uh, means a change of league uh, and climate change is mainstream in all European policies. This is a, a big difference. Before we have a certain mainstreaming and a very good couple with energy policies, uh, now there's no any more couple. It's a multi-joint effort for all European policies. So big is, uh, first point is a change of league. It's uh, not anymore a satellite uh, or a policy, if it was ever a satellite, but it's not a marginal policy. Uh, and climate change is uh, mainstream in all the policies, as I, I, I mentioned. Uh, carbon pricing has worked. Uh, carbon pricing is working, as you mentioned, Maximo. It's, uh, we, were, we are in a 38, 39 euros. But what is more important, it is decarbonizing, so it's not... Uh, the price setting or the price uh, uh, fluctuations, but it's that it's an instrument that in pre-COVID times, so 2019, has reduced around 9% of, of uh, emissions in the ETS sector, with an impressive minus 15% in the power sector. So it is working. So the reflection is uh, building and transport are two sectors that have a big part of the emissions, and we do not see the decarbonization. So what to do? And uh, then is where carbon pricing comes in. Uh, shall we insist on the price signaling? Shall we insist on uh, internal internalizing an externality? And what ETS can contribute? So I'm really interested in the, in the nose part of your graph also, uh, that uh, why this nose? Is that uh, because they are scared that it will uh, destroy or, uh, or put upside down the current ETS. It is because the, the, uh, the cost passed to citizens uh, will be too high. It's because member states will uh, stop or suddenly stop the national policies on uh, building and transport that will be uh, a bad effect. I'm more interested, uh, not in the global no's, but why, the no, why, the, why those no's? And um, so uh, this is the, the um, intention of extending carbon pricing. It's simple. It's an instrument that works, and we need to, to do something on the sectors that they are lagging behind. In my time, 
is uh, small in terms of emissions to an about 3%, depends on how we count. It's a sector depending enormously on global trade. But again, uh, why not to put a price signal in that we have a fuel uh, savings and that we can start decarbonizing on that sector? Just uh, uh, very shortly, two points more. ETS is clearly an instrument of decarbonization. You can modulate the different parameters. It's not uh, a fix on a stone, but we need to give a stability to the market. Uh, but there are two important things. It could be a, a very good source of investment in uh, the revenues from member states and how these revenues are invested. It could be also a good source for distribution and solidarity mechanisms, not only to member states, but also to citizens. And it could be also a possible resource for the European budget that, as you know, we have on the table the impressive recovery plan that I'm very proud of that that the Commission has put in, a, in, a, in place and that member states are now implementing. And this it could be also a possible source of revenue, as European Council mentioned. So all in all, um, no hidden intentions, just a very simple intention. Uh, carbon pricing is working for uh, aviation, for industry and for power sector uh, in, uh, specifically. So we need to export this good story to building and transport. And the question is how to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice, for your clarification and your introduction. I really, I mean, I'm very uh, interested by what you say. What is behind the yes and what is behind the no's? Uh, of course, we didn't extend that to, to that survey to, to that question. So it would have been interesting. But I also have the impression that when you look, if you wish, the two camps, uh, both sides are very convinced about their answers. I see that uh, there is a kind of a very um, important, uh, I would say, endorsement and in, in thinking around the two sides. And that's why I think Sir, as a think tank, wanted to open this discussion and, and look into an independent research. Uh, and I think I would like now to move to the first panel uh, and 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 uh, like to introduce uh, our professor Michael Pollitt uh, from University of Cambridge. He's one of the authors of the study, and um, he uh, he will be followed by reactions again by you. I think Beatrice will be invited to react specifically on the presentation, but also I'd like to uh, welcome Pete Harrison, executive director for EU policy at the European Climate Foundation, to provide his views. On, on this uh, first part of the report. So I don't want to lose any, any more time and I'd like to give uh, the virtual floor to uh, Professor Michael Pollitt and thanks again for joining us, Professor. The floor is yours. Thank you, Maximo, and um, uh, thank you everyone to, for coming and thank you to Beatrice for um, uh, kicking us off. Um, it's a great pleasure to be uh, talking about uh, this study, which uh, Geoffroy Dolphin and myself have um, undertaken on behalf of SER. Um, and we were given the question of, uh, what, is it feasible to extend the European Emissions Trading Scheme to include road transport and heating fuels? And I, I suppose the simple answer is yes. Um, but let me say a bit more about um, what we did in the study. Uh, next slide, Geoffrey. Um, so first of all, um, as good economists, we started by um, thinking about the theoretical properties of an extension of the emissions trading scheme. Its theoretical properties are common to equivalent um, economic measures which price carbon. Um, they certainly, uh, 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 such as an emissions tax or an abatement subsidy. They give rise to a price signal, um, and that uh, has certain desirable properties. So within an emissions trading scheme where you cap, you cap the total quantity of emissions that are being issued in any given year, and you're capping emissions according to a schedule over a series of years, you expect the price of emissions to rise at the real rate of interest. 
You expect that uh, if new information emerges um, about the future demand for emissions, that will affect the price in predictable ways. So as if we have a recession, we would expect the price to go down. Um, if, if we have uh, good news on um, low carbon technologies, we'd also expect the price to go down. Um, and uh, the price reacts to policy. Um, and to policy commitment. If policy commitment increases, if, if complementary policies are tightened, um, such as uh, vehicle emission standards, we also expect the, pr the, the price to react in a positive way, i.e. by going down. Um, and equally, if, if other policies were loosened, we'd expect the price uh, to go up. Uh, and of course, the price is common across all participants and all covered countries uh, and sectors. Um, um, uh, we should uh, also um, point out that if we were to extend the EU ETS and extend it both in time and in scope, that would provide further clarity as to climate commitment on part of on the part of the EU, um, and that, of course, is it would be a desirable property. But then, and we're going to have a, a whole section discussing this. The, in, in, the introduction and extension of a price on emissions to these two new sectors, of course, does raise significant distributional issues. Um, there will be an increased price um, that uh, heating and uh, transport would have to bear as a result of an extension. And how that uh, distributional impact is handled will be crucial to the success of any extension. Um, and of course, it would cause a risk that certain countries would want to leave the EU ETS if they could, but we know that's central to being a member of the, of the EU itself, so it, that would be very difficult. Um, the extension would also have the desirable property of focusing on, on whole chain emissions efficiency rather than just focusing on uh, final use of fuels, which existing um, taxes on fuels, which are very high, uh, sometimes do. Um, and we, of course, are arguing that any extension that, that is put in place must be consistent with net zero targets. So it must target bringing the uh, future emissions down to net zero by 2050 and should involve a linear reduction factor. So it's not about um, keeping the emissions at a certain level and then just reducing them in 2050. We're, we're, we're not arguing that. Uh, next slide. So what is the role of extending the EU ETS within um, the EU's climate ambitions? Um, first of all, I think one of the primary properties that we emphasize in our report is that an emissions trading scheme provides an incentive to stick to long-term policy commitments to 2050 because the scheme itself it builds can build in um, emissions reduction targets out to 2050. Um, and uh, it uh, also provides a good backstop if additional emissions reduction is required to be delivered by higher emissions um, permit prices. Of course, if we're uh, um, experiencing success on complementary policies, such as the rapid ro rollout of renewables or the rapid rollout of electric vehicles or uh, low carbon heating, then the work that we would expect the uh, emissions price to do would be reduced and the pressure on uh, to have high emissions prices within the trading scheme would also be reduced. Um, so we can sort of see um, standards put based policies or technology uh, forcing policies as being complementary to emissions trading schemes. And the reason why we have vehicle emission standards is not just to get emissions down, but because we know that drivers when they purchase new cars can suffer from uh, myopia in their calculation of future uh, energy savings and also because we want to target local pollutants with emission standards not just CO2. Um, so what we argue in the report that a, is that a combination of both uh, an extension of the EU ETS and existing policies um, on emissions uh, standards uh, are complementary to achieving the EU's climate objectives. The impact of the extension would be uh, substantial um, 
just doing a, a, a straightforward calculation of uh, the average uh, em uh, price of CO2 within different EU economies and across the EU itself um, says that the average price at the moment is about 11 euros when we did this analysis. Extending it to road transport and to heating would approximately double the price and would uh, significantly increase the coverage of uh, carbon pricing from about 45% to 79% of emissions. Um, and the impact within individual countries will vary according to um, how uh, decarbonized those economies are at the moment. And certain countries will experience much sharper rises in average uh, emissions prices than others, according to the existing levels of coverage. Um, we should, uh, and we spent a lot, a lot of time in the report discussing how uh, emissions trading extension uh, complements existing EU policies. Um, existing EU policies to which impact on emissions are um, extensive. Um, they, they exist within covered sectors and within um, road transport and buildings, and they also include energy taxation. Of course, one of the things to note from this uh, slide is that even within sectors that are currently covered by the EU ETS, we, all, we all also have significant other complementary policies which drive um, emissions reduction. Um, so one of the questions that might come up is, well, don't we already price uh, energy um, quite heavily through energy taxation? Um, why do we need to uh, extend carbon pricing across to uh, transport and heating? Well, the answer is it's a very patchy coverage. It's not harmonized across member states. It's not based on the carbon content of fuels, one of the most glaring emissions uh, uh, omissions at the moment is that the uh, lack of taxation on um, the, the combustion of gas for heating, um, which generally commands very low tax rates across Europe and means that you don't have harmonization across the use of uh, fossil fuels in electricity and in heating at the moment. And it's, it's not even clear that for transport, once you take into across all the other externalities that are associated with burning fuels um, in the transport sector, that um, carbon pricing is not required to, to additionally reflect the climate impact. There is carbon pricing across a number of EU countries at the moment for both road transport and heating. This is explicit uh, carbon content taxation. Um, and uh, the extension of the EU ETS would offer an opportunity to uh, to harmonize uh, existing um, taxes, which sometimes exist, but often don't exist and vary considerably across countries uh, in Europe. Um, we also talk about in the report, well, OK, let's think about how implementation would actually work. and. One might worry that if you extend carbon pricing to uh, heating and transport, because those are potentially quite difficult to um, abate sectors, maybe the EU uh, A prices would spike. Um, so, you know, we want an orderly extension, which doesn't involve the price suddenly going up um, as a result of extension. Um, and there's no reason to think that the price would spike. Um, as long as you have adequate banking and borrowing of, of uh, permits across uh, years. And currently there is, uh, banking is allowed between part periods and, and borrowing is allowed within periods of the uh, trading of EUA permits. Um, and there's currently a big surplus. So one wouldn't imagine that a, a, a well worked out extension consistent with net zero targets would lead to a sudden spike in um, the prices of permits. Um, and as that previous slide showed, in some countries there is uh, the potential to uh, mitigate the impact of a common extension 
um, by adjusting existing carbon taxes or uh, excise duties uh, downwards to, to, to compensate for the fact that you're now pricing the carbon element. And then the final um, question that I'll discuss in this uh, part of our report is, well, is there any reason to think that if we extend um, emissions trading to uh, transport and heating, and perhaps to transport in particular, that there will be um, some pressure to roll back on existing uh, emission standards, particularly around vehicles, or to roll back on standards on um, low carbon heating? Um, and the answer is there's no evidence that that would be the case. Um, a good case study which we look at is California, where they haven't uh, a comprehensive um, carbon trading scheme, which does include heating and transport. Um, and there's been no rollback on complementary policies. Indeed, um, one uh, could see that the incentive is to strengthen com complementary policies in order to mitigate um, the potential price impact within the emissions trading scheme. And California has a, has a, a well-articulated view that the emissions trading scheme that it has is a backstop um, which will kick in with higher carbon prices if all of these complementary policies don't actually deliver. And that just illustrates the, the idea that in reality, governments will um, find that these policies are uh, self-reinforcing. Uh, Thank you very much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this very uh, concise and stimulating presentation. Now, let me come back to, to Beatriz. Beatriz, of course, um, I know that you have read the, the whole report, uh, but how do you react to this particular presentation? Do you see the same benefits of pushing these two important sectors into the, let's say, ETS basket? And what about the challenges, in particular, the interplay uh, of this potential extension with existing regulation? And I think many of the participants are, are, are moving into this direction. So we, for instance, in transport, we have the CO2 standards and they say, okay, they are working, they are working. Do we need to take the risk to extend ETS? Uh, and this is what people are keep on asking. So I'm happy to hear from you on, on these uh, two elements. Well, uh, many, many thanks, Maximo, and many thanks, Michael, for the excellent report and presentation. So my, my first reaction is, Michael, can you join the Commission for a couple of months to help us in the drafting? It will be great. Um, very positive reaction. I think the points uh, that you have, uh, you have raised uh, are the points we are studying and, uh, and uh, uh, as you know, in the Commission process, we put on the table pros, cons, different options. We do a proper assessment. We need, we have to do a, an honest assessment, and then we go with a favorite option. Clearly, what uh, Michael you have tackled is uh, part of our uh, own work. We don't see a contradiction between a member states' policies. We see a reinforcement. Uh, we see a reinforcement with other European policies. You mentioned a good list. I will add also the Energy Efficiency Directive. And just let me put a, a personal bracket. Uh, I was uh, years ago working in the uh, renewable energy policy when the, it was started, and it was a clear dichotomy on the table, and for me a wrong dichotomy. Shall we push renewables or shall we do emission trading? And the answer, thanks God, we need to do both. So you need price signaling and you need all the types of policies. So the key thing is how you, as in a good uh, resonance physical effect, the, uh, the effort of different policies come with a larger effect if, as if co compared as they, if they were alone. So uh, no intention from the commission to backslide on any policy, no intention. This I can leave it, so I can say it very clearly. We are going also to, reinforce the CO2 standards. And on the table is, shall we leave the effort sharing, which includes, as you know, building transport, waste and agriculture, and uh, shall we uh, backslide on that? No way that we uh, ask member state to backslide, and all the work that is uh, being done on a member state level or with the building directive 
will need to reinforce, be, re be reinforced by carbon pricing. So we'll uh, make uh, is the good signal of the economy. So um, uh, there are many voices that are worried that because we put a carbon price in uh, extension to transport and building, we are going to suddenly abandon all other European policies or the push to member states policies. I can confirm, no. We, will, uh, we are not a non-backsliding and uh, we, are, we are all aware that uh, uh, decarbonization are complex policies. So we will need to see how they all interact together, be it energy efficiency or a building directive or renewable energies. So this is uh, my major comment on, on Michael uh, on Michael uh, points uh, on the uh, a member state leaving the EU. I hope not, but clearly not due to uh, ETS. This is uh, we have we will have a good decision making in both council and parliament. And I have more. I have um, I hope that uh, the ETS, both distributional and uh, and uh, also the part of contribution to European budgets, it will uh, improve the marketing with the citizen of uh, carbon pricing. And I think this has been one of the successes of California. They have been very transparent and very explicit of what money from the ETS finances what. And we have been probably too shy, and member states have been clearly too shy on what uh, the money out, out of the revenues of ETS is invested on which type of decarbonizing policy. So I hope we will have a, a better narrative for the citizen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice, to, to react and to complement uh, the Michael's presentation. I, 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 think, um, I think it was pretty clear, I mean, your, your, your last statements. And now I'd like to turn to, to, to Pete Harrison. Pete, uh, you have a long experience on on, on transport, and, and I'm sure you have seen a lot of different uh, ideas and projections and policies. Now we're moving to this minus 55 percent, and um, and my question to you is, um, how much do you uh, uh, let's say endorse of this idea of complementarity, or to what extent you see that it's more one than it's better to have more one than the other uh, element. Thanks, Marcelo. Um, very interested to see the results of your survey. It reminded me a little bit of the uh, results of the Brexit vote. Uh, so uh, illustrates the level of polarization. Um, you know, suffice to say, I'm I'm British, but uh, I now hold a Belgian passport, uh, <laughs> and I'll build on that by saying I voted no uh, to extension. Um, so I think the um, we, we, are, we are at a historical point, right, in, in climate policy. If we look back, we saw in 2019, very clearly um, the public spoke out, climate marches took place all over Europe. There was the uh, Fridays for Future movement. Clearly citizens uh, clearly stated that, uh, you know, they, they wanted a, a, a true commitment on climate action. And uh, we're very pleased uh, that the Commission and uh, the Member States have come forward with the idea of moving to minus 55%. Um, and for the first time now, Europe is truly on track for net zero and for doing uh, what it takes. And so we come to the question of, you know, how does one actually implement minus 55%? And not just the Commission, but you know, governments around Europe are starting to look at this question. What is the balance between policies? What role does carbon pricing play? And I think it's important to note that in historically, carbon pricing has mainly applied uh, to industrial sectors uh, within the ETS. And this is the first time that we're really talking seriously uh, about applying that directly to consumers. So what does that mean for consumers? And I think we really need to take the time to look at that in detail from a, a, from a sort of bottom-up consumer perspective, not just in a sort of top-down modeling perspective. Now, firstly, I'll just in a sort of top-down modeling perspective. Now, firstly, I'd like to state, you know, the, the goal of the European Climate Foundation uh, is to support the transition to a net zero economy by mid-century. Uh, that's been uh, my job day in, day out uh, for 10 years. I've spent seven of those years focusing day in, day out on how to decarbonize transport. 
Um, we do believe that this transition is going to be very good for consumers in terms of the technological shift. Uh, the shift to renewables will lower energy costs uh, for consumers. That's very clear in the commission modeling uh, for the long-term strategies. It's very clear in the uh, ECF's own modeling uh, that we've supported, um, particularly when renewables is combined with electrification, or, or shall I say smart electrification, we actually find that the system costs are considerably lower uh, from a consumer perspective uh, than a fossil energy system. Uh, if we look at uh, electric cars, which is you know what, one of the examples we're looking at here, we're familiar with the uh, modeling done by the consumer groups uh, who are represented here by Bayok, uh, showing that the, the transition uh, to electric vehicles will be uh, beneficial to consumers, both the first owner and especially for the second owner. Uh, and, and it's a great leveler in a way, you know, it lowers the cost of mobility for uh, low income families. That said, so we're very clear this is beneficial to consumers, but how you do it uh, in terms of policy is hugely important. Um, and the question is, how do you create change to reach that minus 55% uh, milestone? Well, I think it's clear that the ETS is working on coal. I think the jury is out on whether the ETS is really contributing to the industrial transformation that's needed on heavy industry or aviation. Um, so, I mean, let's be honest about that. Um, most people within the industry that I talk to in either of those two sectors do not believe that the ETS is the driving force. Um, and then the question is, what happens when you when you put that directly onto consumers? Now, I think here we would urge caution. I, I wouldn't like to say, you know, a blanket no. I'd like to say, you know, let's think this through properly. Uh, we funded research that shows, uh, under a reasonable scenario, inclusion of uh, heating fuels in the ETS would lead to a 20% cost increase uh, for the heating the homes of the lowest income quarter of the population. And for that poorest quarter of the population, there would be a 10% increase in the cost of mobility. And this is confirmed by the Commission's own impact assessment that also shows a, a, a significant impact on welfare of European citizens. And of course, the Gilets Jaunes protests were about more than just uh, cost of fuel, but it was a significant trigger. And by coincidence, that was a 10% increase that brought the, the, the Gilets Jaunes onto the streets. So in my mind, what the Commission is looking at here is a very important question and with very important consequences if the Commission makes the wrong choice. And this is why we, as, as, as a, uh, a organization that is wholly committed to net zero, are asking for um, a, a more thoughtful consideration of the consumer impacts. I think that it, it, it requires thinking, you know, it, for your average citizen in rural France, or for that matter, rural Southeast Europe, pushing up their cost of gasoline, how do they respond? Could they buy an electric car? In many cases, not right now. Uh, could they, do they have access to mass transit? Uh, probably not. And if we look at home heating, uh, do they, you know, do they have access to the zero carbon heat networks uh, that they would need to avoid that cost? Otherwise you're penalizing them without giving them any means to shift behavior. In terms of the impact on emissions, which of course is, is, is a key focus, uh, the, the modeling we funded, and we funded many different uh, pieces of modeling using many different approaches, and it all points towards the fact that transport, because of its inel inelasticity, needs a carbon price of somewhere around three or 400 euros per ton before you even start making an impact. And before you get there, of course, that, that impacts on people's lives in, in the ways I've described. It's no coincidence that the main um, group pushing this has been the oil industry. They've, uh, they, they understand the, the difficulty of using carbon pricing to achieve the same goals. Um, now, um, it's worth thinking about the alternatives because I don't want, just want to be negative about this one policy approach without thinking about the alternatives. 
the standards are working. Um, I think that this, this debate about the ETS grew out of a period, uh, uh, you know, just over a year ago when the evidence might have suggested that the standards weren't working. But it's very clear, you get to 2020 and boom, emissions decline directly uh, to, the, to the limit value set by uh, the European Union for, for, for vehicles. Now, it may not be happening quick enough, and that is precisely because the political process has delayed multiple phases of standard setting. Yeah? We shouldn't forget that diesel gate occurred. Yeah? Nor should we forget that in the truck sector, we, we've seen the biggest cartel fine ever levied by the European Commission. These are all important factors. Uh, it, and what I'm saying here is it is absolutely wrong to draw any conclusion that the standards as an instrument are not functioning. Uh, much has been done to improve that. Um, so most of the talk has been about uh, applying carbon pricing via the cost of fuel. I think we should give serious thoughts to uh, applying the cost of carbon via the sales taxes in a sort of bonus malice approach as, as has been used effectively in France. Um, and that is much less regressive than putting that, the cost on fuel. Um, because by definition, that targets uh, wealthier um, citizens and uh, corporates who are buying um, uh, cars for their car fleets. And in addition to that, around half of the uh, new vehicle sales in Europe are made to corporates. So there are tools like uh, fleet uh, taxes and the fiscal policy for fleets. These are the kind of levers which I, th uh, I think having, you know, having been looking at this for a few years that are more effective and less regressive. And I think the Commission really needs to give some serious thought and imagination uh, to um, non-regressive policy approaches be before it goes further down this path. And so in conclusion, um, uh, I'd uh, reiterate, you know, this is a historical moment because what Europe does may be copied around the world. And I think the onus is on the proponents uh, of expanding the ETS, and the onus is on the European Commission uh, to show that this can be done in a way that delivers a predictable uh, carbon price signal. Uh, the history of the ETS looks a little bit like the share price of GameStop. Uh, so if you're going to apply that kind of carbon price uh, to consumers, you need to make sure it is predictable, it is less volatile. Uh, I think the onus is on the Commission to show that uh, a regressive impact can be avoided or compensated, and that uh, the diluting effect on other policies really is uh, avoided, not just when the Commission makes its proposal, but then during the political process of the next two years afterwards. And finally, uh, the onus is to make sure that this policy fits within the Green Deal, and fits within the Green Deal, meaning fits within the idea of a socially just transition. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Pete. Thank you so much. Uh, you have launched a bit the uh, discussion and with, uh, with several points, and also giving a bit of historical perspective and where are we coming and where are we going. Um, and and I, I have, uh, receive, we have received so many questions for all the panelists, and I'd like to pick two and ask a reaction from each of you. It can be a short reaction from these two questions. First question, someone is saying, one carbon price may not be meaningful for all sectors. Can we envisage a sectoral price or price corridor to reinforce signal and not rely on quantity only? First question for everybody. Second question, Many people are saying, okay, um, what about renovation and, and, and the, the big plan of the commission and renovate Europe? Is the commission considering a EU-wide renovation fund, especially for the low income households, financed by the revenues from carbon pricing? Um, this is also a question uh, link, linking the big plans for renovate uh, the big, big, big uh, buildings and uh, ETS. 
can maybe start with Michael for the first question, so multiple uh, uh, CO2 prices for different sectors. Okay. Um, well, of course, the advantage of the uh, common carbon price is that you are emphasizing the fact that this is a policy which targets the variable of interest, which is uh, getting emissions down. Okay. Um, whether you want different prices in different sectors, I think that's a matter of preference. I mean, of course, we do observe that in reality, um, the marginal cost of abatement is different in different sectors with different policies. And in, in a way, okay, that's all right, but we need to recognize that is fundamentally inefficient. And I suppose that um, one of the things I want to emphasize, which I think is lost if you, if you focus on the price aspect of the emissions trading scheme, is I think our study tries to emphasize that the key aspect of an emissions trading scheme is the quantity lim limitation that it's, you know, it's not the same as a common carbon tax. It is about controlling the aggregate quantity of emissions to meet your aggregate target, and no other policy does that. So I think this focusing on what the outturn price is in different sectors is actually misplaced, and we need to keep our eyes fixed on the aggregate quantity. Thanks. Uh, Beatrice, your your take on this idea of multiple pricing, uh, and it's also especially because we see in Germany they took the, the initiative to set some uh, CO2 prices for buildings and, 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 and transport. So is that moving the fact is happening? And, and how do you see the, the, the different, uh, let's say, multi-pricing idea? Well, just, uh, just before going there, I will uh, not be very disciplined and I'll just... Uh, to react to Peter's intervention that uh, uh, he has, you had uh, many valid points, Pete. But just to, to mention that uh, current ETS is not mainly applied to industry. Current ETS is already applied to consumers because this major part is electricity. And, uh, and this, of course, has an increase of electricity prices and also a balance due to new renewable energies coming and with low marginal costs. Um, the, the heating and transport, you are absolutely right that we need to take in uh, important consideration the, the effect on, uh, on social and fair transition. But I wonder if it's uh, fair also that nearly 20% of the households in Europe and the majority low-income households are still uh, heated up with coal and oil. So uh, we will need to put all the means to change behaviour and clearly have uh, this distributional part. On the, on the corridor, on your question, Maximo, I think that uh, uh, we could envisage also a separated ETS for building and transport uh, with a different price. This is also this also on the table, this option. That's, uh, but uh, I would like also, as uh, in line with what Michael said, is that the important thing is the quantity reduction and not the focusing on, on pricing. Thank you, Beatrice. Pete, now uh, you can react to to react to Beatrice, Michael, and also the question, please. Um, just on the on the multiple price signals, I, th I think this is absolutely right um, to 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 give this serious consideration. If we look at um, what's happened in the last few years, um, as ETS prices raised from you know ten euros per ton. Uh, to above 20 euros per ton uh, in the, around 2018, we saw huge amounts of coal being driven off the system. And so clearly in the power sector, uh, the, it, the uh, power generation is very responsive to uh, ETS prices at those levels. Um, but if we look at some of the more kind of advanced technologies um, and innovation, we find that much, much higher prices are needed. Uh, so if you look at, you know, what does it take to uh, deliver a business case for green steel? It's, you know, 150 euros per ton or more. If you look at what it takes in aviation, it's going up into the, into the hundreds of euros. Uh, and in fact, I've seen some modeling uh, that was done for the uh, aviation industry itself, which showed that a 30 euros per ton carbon price signal only really delivers like a, a 3% reduction in emissions per decade. And so it's a, it's a very rich area for discussion. Um, I think there's huge potential there. 
uh, to achieve more by, by splitting uh, uh, out uh, the price signal between sectors uh, and allowing uh, greater uh, predictability. Um, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. There is also another question, which of course uh, is more linked to the second panel, but I think it's important because we have, we have Beatrice with us uh, representing the commission is, do we think that at some point when we make an assessment of potential extensions and the different policies, the distribution and the effects could become a red line to say, no, this is too much. This is a real risk that we cannot afford, especially in this context. And I know that this is a difficult question because it can be very political, it can be very sensitive. But the question is, if we are making an assessment and the commission is doing that, and distributional effects shows that limit, would, be, would the commission reconsider the way it will implement policy uh, concerning reduction of emissions for transport and heating? Is, is it a real red line for you or not? That's the question. And I like also maybe Michael, because then uh, Dr. Dolphin will go into it. Uh, but maybe asking Michael if you if you see that uh, that red line uh, is something uh, likely or unlikely. Uh, let me uh, let me have a very clear answer there. Um, we will not make any proposal that doesn't have a very good consideration to the distributional aspects. It's uh, the Green Deal is crystal clear there, or it's a fair transition, or it's not a transition. And uh, all my bosses, uh, von der Leyen president or, or executive vice president uh, Timmermans are absolutely convinced of this line. So we will not present a proposal that ignores or doesn't treat well as uh, coming for the distributional aspects. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, saying that we will please everybody and we will be the perfect proposal. And of course, our proposal will be discussed as a uh, council and parliament. But uh, no way that we present uh, uh, ETS without uh, giving a proper consideration to distributional aspects. Michael? Um, yeah, <laughs> um, obviously we're going to have a whole discussion about distributional aspects. Let me just respond to some things that people have been saying. Um, you know, what, what, what we emphasize in the report is this is a dynamic commitment on the part of the EU to meeting its targets. If uh, you have this in place, what you then would expect to happen is uh, in order to meet the targets, we need to expect uh, heating decarbonization to proceed at a, in a certain way and to kick in in a certain year. So I imagine it kicks in in 2035. Um, prices would only go up. Uh, in an unpredictable way if we were not on track to deliver the dynamic reductions in uh, in carbon from particular sectors in the way that the market expects. So, you know, the idea that this is somehow, you know, going to all be a surprise um, and that somehow we need to have very high prices now, that's not what the what a, a properly function mar functioning market will deliver. Um, it'll kick in the idea that decarbonization is going to happen in certain periods at certain times in order to meet the, t the target. And it's only if we're not on track to do that that we'll see prices begin to spike. Um, so it's important to emphasize that. The other thing that is important to emphasize is final consumers are not directly exposed to carbon prices, not directly. They're only indirectly exposed to them through the pricing methodologies and through the net subsidy effects. So, you know, we can we can have uh, revenue recycling schemes. We can have low income consumer uh, prices for certain types of heating fuel, for instance. Um, we can do that to mitigate the the wholesale impact of carbon prices. And of course, you, the, you, you know, what you observe when you watch the EUA price is the short run price of carbon. Um, what things like renewables have done is they've bought uh, emissions reduction under a long term contract, you know, and it's possible to 
uh, reduce the exposure of consumers through long-term contracting for low carbon uh, technologies. So, you know, the actual implementation of this, which goes around the, um, the actual extension of the uh, trading scheme is going to be very important and can mitigate the effect that consumers actually feel. Thank you, Michael. I think that was very, very clear. And a question for Pete. Pete, do you agree? Do you agree with the assessment? And, and um, where, where do you see this red light coming, especially in this very particular situation uh, in COVID time? Um, so, I, 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 in, in principle, yes, I, I, I hear Michael's argument, um, but I think it's worth taking a moment to try to sort of understand how that's going to feel in the real world, right? It is possible to design means of redistributing uh, the revenues uh, to, to mitigate any regressive effect. But in principle, right, that at the moment revenues are paid into the treasuries and, and it will need to be, uh, the, the cost will need to be returned to citizens by, by national governments. And what I'd be quite worried about is the optics of the European Commission or Brussels, as it will be reported in the tabloid media, pushing up the cost of heating your home, pushing up the cost of driving your car, and then national governments coming to the rescue. And anyone who's spent time in EU politics knows that's what always happens, right? And, you know, we can theoretically say, you know, the, 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 there's no evidence that that will happen in future. But of course, we know that's what will happen, yeah? Because that's what always happens. Brussels always gets blamed. And I think it'd be very sad if, um, if Brussels gets blamed, if von der Leyen gets blamed for, for a Green Deal which has huge potential and really is what is needed right now um, and to deliver on the climate targets and to deliver on a socially just transition. So I just say, so, you know, it, it, think a little bit deeper than pure techno-economic modelling. Think a little bit about the political communications aspects and, and, and the political optics. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Pete. Um, I think I will ask maybe the very last question to you because time is running and we will move now uh, after that uh, into the, the, the effects and distributional uh, effects uh, very much in detail with the presentation. Uh, but I think that was interesting to give a flavor and I think there's also another element which is carbon leakage. I think it was mentioned the industry and how to deal with that. But um, what we haven't mentioned, and one of the questions is about energy taxation directive. And, um, and this is an old, old uh, legislation that we all know it's, it's, it's there and the commission now is saying, but it's possible to bring it back. Um, I would like to know, uh, again, on the overlap on the consistency on the efficiency of, of policy design, uh, what role could play a, a revised, a really needed revised uh, energy taxation directive? and how this can help to either uh, adjust ETS, extend ETS, or to keep ETS as it is. So maybe, uh, Beatrice, if you can give us your, your quick reaction on this question. Uh, it's a shame that we have such a short time because it's uh, the, um, the distributional effects and how uh, costs uh, are passed through consumer and citizen is, uh, is a, is a fascinating uh, debate and very important. Just before I go to taxation, just uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, clarify that the problem of unfairness is already there. So it's, it's like if uh, I will be a polemic, but it's like if we discover the distributional problem of transport and building fuel supply with the ETS extension. There are 15 million people in Europe that has uh, that we call energy poverty. So it is there. And uh, I think that we will need to, uh, to do something and fast. So this is, uh, an, uh, so it's, uh, if I could say it's, uh, the ETS is not uh, Harry Potter and is not a magician. We, we are not innocent there. We will need infrastructure, we will need social policies, we will need renewables, we will need a standards, we will need member states, we will need local, we will need a huge, coherent set of policies because in the country I live in 
and uh, I can do a, uh, also a not very diplomatic list of aberrations, and I'm afraid it's not the only one. So the problem is already there. We, uh, I hope we, we are not all discovering uh, thanks to the ETS extension, but I'm, I'm with you that we need to play correctly and not with the best intentions uh, put on the table a clumsy uh, policy. Uh, so uh, just uh, without, and passing by, of course, air, air quality and local pollution problems and, and health problem. Taxation. Taxation is there. I mean, taxation is in, uh, in heating, taxation is in, uh, in, uh, in transport, uh, uh, you know, in electricity, of course, um, and it's part of the prices uh, all European citizens uh, pay. It's a, a very dispersed, heterogeneous picture, incredible heterogeneous picture, and not all the time very fair, I will, I, I will, uh, I will say, and I will uh, be again diplomatic for not uh, showing aberrations. Or just a bracket, 160 billion euros are spending in fossil fuel subsidies, just as a tip. So taxation, we are working together with our colleagues in, uh, in taxation on what um, uh, a European tax could help there. Uh, the problem, of course, of taxation is not, I will not discover to you that it goes uh, through unanimity. So uh, this has uh, political challenges and risk of having a kind of minimum agreement what uh, uh, we are, I, I can only tell at, at this moment from Commission is that we will be uh, as uh, as um, coherent as we can on the both. We work together with them, and that uh, taxation of fuels, uh, well, it's there in a member state level and uh, shy at European level. And the debate is: uh, shall we do a, a higher point? Uh, shall we do it through an ETS? with the advantages of flexibility, or shall we go to the unanimity machine and a taxation machine? But uh, it's not a secret that, um, as uh, we have in the political debate, it's a, it's a difficult uh, dossier. Thank you, Beatrice, for, for being so honest and direct uh, with all your concepts. Now, maybe Michael first, and then Pete to conclude this, this really excellent first panel. Michael? Yeah, well, I, I think that I think the discussion about energy taxation just highlights the difficulty of um, any coordination which is decentralised to member states, um, and the importance of policies like the like EU ETS, which actually achieve the overall objective um, by a common policy. Um, and uh, I suppose what we discuss in the report is the idea that you can use existing energy taxes to uh, potentially absorb the initial impact of EU ETS extension in certain sectors. So it is true that, that uh, taxes on fuels are very high at the moment uh, in many countries, and that would allow you to absorb the initial introduction of, of the EU ETS into the transport sector. So creative things like that are, are good ideas. Thanks, Michael, for that complimentary. And Pete, to conclude. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to return to some sort of first principles, right? Um, the distributional impact uh, of the cost of the transition is a political problem. And for a political problem, uh, we need political tools. And taxation is a political tool. Taxation can be done fairly uh, to avoid a regressive impact. Uh, you know, there's a long history and experience of means adjusting uh, taxation. And it is not volatile, it delivers a stable signal. Markets, on the other hand, by definition, are volatile. Uh, I, I don't think I need to labor the point, but, you know, that is the nature of a market. And even with the, you know, I referred to some modeling earlier that tells us that, you know, that the cost could go up for 20% on heating by 2030. Do, do we know whether that will be a steady increase or would it happen a bit more like it happened in 2018 when we went suddenly up 20% in, in one or two years? We don't know. I can't argue that and I, and I, and I don't believe that there's anyone who could demonstrate that in a, in a credible way. So by definition, uh, the ETS is volatile and uh, markets are volatile and achieving a just transition requires predictability. 
right? We need to prepare for the reskilling, the retraining, the inward investment uh, that helps communities and people adjust. We need to help consumers and citizens adjust to the new technologies and, 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 the, and the new future. Um, and so, uh, and the other thing we know about markets is they don't distribute costs fairly. They distribute costs uh, more heavily on, on the poor than they do on the rich. Uh, so I think um, that, that it's worth uh, bearing those points in mind uh, as we make the next choice. Pete, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like now to thank you, all of you, uh, Michael, Pete, Beatrice, for your contributions and your reflections for such a complex issue. Uh, I also like to say, yes, this is a historic moment. It's not easy. And, and I believe that these kind of debates help us to understand that um, decision makers don't have an easy task. And it's so important that we all commit and we all engage with the passion you do. And, and this is very important. Uh, so I would like to thank you again for taking this, this time. And uh, I'd like now to move to the second panel, which is about effects, distributional effects, and how we manage that. So, but please, you can, you can stay with us. And um, let me introduce maybe uh, first the panelists of this second session. So we have a co-author of the report, Dr. Geoffrey Dolphin. Welcome, Geoffrey, from the University of Cambridge. And uh, we will also have, uh, reacting to the report, uh, Director General at BELC, Monique Royens. Welcome. You represent the voice of consumers in Brussels, representing more than 44 independent consumer organizations from 32 countries. So it's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And, and as well, uh, you did, Kirtan Darling, uh, current Deputy Director General and at Industry All, representing the unions in Brussels with millions of workers across the continent. So many thanks both of you for, for joining. And before I open the floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Dolphin, uh, I'd like to share the second question we ask in our online, uh, online uh, survey. And um, if you can see, the uh, question is, do you think the EU emissions trading system should be extended to road transport and building uh, between brackets heating? And uh, there you see that 32% said that mitigating distributional effects should be equally as important as cutting emissions from road transport and buildings as fast as possible. 29% they said it's more important to cut emissions Distribution effects are manageable. So there you see a sort of uh, different prioritization. Um, and 23%, they said the distributional effects should be a priority and therefore they represent a red line to go ahead with extension. And only 16% uh, said that distribution effects are not important at all, not important. Now, um, I would like to now ask uh, Dr. Dolphin to present the findings of the report, focus on the effects, distributional effects, uh, and, uh, and to share with us uh, his views on, on, on how to manage and how to alleviate those effects. The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Dolphin. Um, Massimo, thank you very much. Um, I will share the slides in a second if you take yours down. Thank you. Great. Um, give me one second. Right. I suppose everyone can see the slides. Um, it will take one or two seconds to adjust on the mainstream. Great. Um, Massimo, thank you very much for, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to be to be with you all and with the panelists uh, uh, to discuss the issue today. Um, I suppose by way of introduction and, and linking uh, with the previous debate uh, and discussion, um, I um, my colleague and uh, fellow panelists um, urge for caution 
when it comes to the extension of the EU ETS and, and, and you know, and due, um, due consideration to be placed on uh, the distributional impacts. Um, this being said, I would also like to emphasize that, you know, before getting into the details, one way to actually um, reduce the, the cost and the distributional impact uh, of uh, climate policy at the EU or national level, um, it's also to design the least cost policy mix. And one thing that we uh, have um, conveyed and that we try to convey in the report is that um, an EU ETS extension combined with existing standards um, which tackle other, um, other externalities or uh, market failures can actually deliver um, the target in, in, a, in a least cost way. Um, so that's, that's for, uh, say, the brief um, introduction and I suppose bridging between, between the two debates. Um, now, digging deeper into the, the distributional impacts, well, um, we have to recognize that introducing carbon pricing um, into these sectors uh, will lead to um, a rise in um, the end user uh, retail prices of the fuels that are now subject to the mechanism. Um, that is pretty um, unequivocal. What is uh, more crucial, what is uh, wh where, where there is some uncertainty is, well, exactly by how much um, this uh, price, the retail prices will, will increase. And second, who will bear the, the burden of, uh, of that increase and um, whether it will be um, shared equally between um, the fuel retailers and the end consumers of, um, of the fuel, be they households or industries, um, or whether um, they will be shared, uh, sorry, or, they, or whether the burden will fall more heavily on one uh, side or the other. Well, um, given the low, uh, at least short-run price elasticity of demand for fuels, um, uh, it is very likely that there will be full pass-through um, from um, uh, the, the increased uh, penalty on carbon to uh, retail fossil fuel prices, um, and that the end consumers, industry or households, will uh, share um, a significant, sorry, will um, incur a significant burden of the, um, a significant share of the burden. Um, the, the one caveat um, is that uh, to some extent and in some industrial sectors, uh, they themselves have the possibility to pass this cost through further downstream. Um, I mean, and this varies and the possibility might not be uh, very high, but at least in theory it exists. Um, I suppose what we did in the report is to focus more specifically on, on households. Um, and a key factor in the determination of um, the distributional impact uh, on, on households is uh, fuel price elasticity across income groups. So, uh, I mean, uh, we do not live in, uh, in equal societies um, and uh, the, the the evidence um, shows that the burden might fall more heavily on um, poorer households than, than richer households. Um, so there are several, um, several reasons for that. Um, some, some of them are, are listed there. Oh, the three more important ones uh, are listed there. Uh, one is that the, the share of uh, spending um, on carbon intensive goods by uh, uh, by consumers is higher for uh, lower income households than it is for um, higher income households. Um, the price, the fuel price elasticity as well is lower uh, when you look at the lower income brackets than uh, when you look at the, the higher income brackets. Um, and then the, 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 last, um, the, the last factor or the last major factor is, is the extent of fuel poverty. Um, so, so these three together, um, these three together really um, uh, lead to uh, some regressive impacts of uh, carbon pricing um, within economies and, and at, the, uh, at the EU level. I'll come to the sort of um, inter-European uh, inter distributional impacts in a second. 
So, um, so these are the three main factors. What is, what is also important to note is that even within income brackets, um, one might have different distributional impacts. This is what uh, economists refer to as horizontal, horizontal um, uh, distributional impacts, which is that um, even within the same, uh, or even for households uh, or individuals of uh, similar income, um, because of where they live, because of the type of technology they use, um, they might still be hit uh, differently by a uh, uh, same carbon price. Um, so it is really important to acknowledge that, um, as, um, uh, as uh, we have noted in the previous discussion, um, what we think is also important to note is that um, alternative policies are not necessarily uh, better or in the sense that they're not necessarily more progressive, uh, if progressive at all, um, than uh, carbon pricing. Um, so yes, fuel efficiency standards do have some progressive impacts, but not in, uh, not in, in all contexts. Um, the, the second point is that um, as we have already mentioned, uh, revenue recycling can be um, sorry, re revenue recycling can be a powerful tool uh, to address distributional impacts. Um, it can be so uh, within national context. It can be so uh, at the EU level by redistributing um, EU allowances revenue, for instance. Um, it also differs. The distributional impacts also differ across sector. So one notable difference is that um, in some countries, in some national contexts, uh, carbon pricing is progressive in the transport sector um, to the extent that it is uh, better off households and better off individuals that um, actually um, drive more miles, uh, more miles per year. And, and finally, I think it's important to not lose sight of the objective that we are trying to achieve here, which is mitigating climate change and um, not addressing uh, climate change impacts and the buildup of uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere that leads to it is also uh, opening the door to uh, pretty substantial impacts uh, on uh, poorer households and um, you know, the capacity for adaptation um, is also lower for uh, poorer households in, in society. So, so that is also uh, pretty uh, important to keep in mind. Um, now, I said I would come back to the um, inter-European uh, distributional impacts or heterogeneous impact uh, of uh, a homogeneous carbon price. Um, what is fairly uh, obvious there is that um, given the tightening of the European Commission's um, climate policy objective, um, there is ever less scope for um, sharing the burden heterogeneously uh, between member states according to their um, income per capita. So what this means, uh, in other words, is that uh, they'll need, they'll, there will need to be an effort uh, by uh, everyone, uh, every single European member, uh, European member state. Yet, um, not all European member states have suddenly become, uh, become uh, better off or are in uh, the same uh, income per capita bracket. So this means that uh, relatively some member states and some sectors of these member states will be hit more uh, substantially by an homogeneous uh, EU-wide policy. And this aspect as well, um, inter-European um, distribution of burden needs to be addressed. And because there is less scope within the policy that is being implemented, um, it is important to design uh, external mechanisms um, and the European Commission hasn't waited uh, for this report to act on that and has set up um, the Just Transition Fund, for example. Um, but, but, but this is very important. Um, and by way of illustration, uh, in the road transport sector that you see, that you see now, a country like Poland um, has caught up with the European average, uh, so to speak, in terms of fuel consumption per, per capita. And so 
um, would be uh, would be hit uh, fairly significantly or relatively more significantly than uh, uh, countries, EU members with higher income per capita. Um, the picture is a bit more mixed uh, for heating, uh, especially because even within uh, the group of uh, EU members that are better off, um, uh, there is more heterogeneity in, in this consumption. Um, but overall, um, there, is a, there is a need for uh, substantial uh, pan-European redistribution. And uh, this could be achieved via the Just Transition Fund or uh, via redistribution of allowance revenue. Um, and this can be determined uh, in due course. So I suppose I anticipated a bit uh, on this slide um, where, uh, where we are essentially unpacking the various ways uh, these distributional uh, impacts could be, uh, could be addressed. So the first, uh, the first possibility is direct financial compensation. Um, and I've already alluded to uh, the possibility to do that across member states um, and to, uh, or the necessity to do that across member states. Um, what is really important is um, to also address the distributional impacts within member states. And this could be done via direct financial compensation. Um, now, as to the details of that, um, there are some mechanisms that are in place. Uh, I mean, we mentioned California, uh, to which I'll come back in a second. Um, but there are also mechanisms in place um, at both the provincial and federal level in Canada. Um, and in fact, interestingly there, um, the federal scheme that is in place provides more um, compensation than some of the provincial schemes. Um, and uh, not, the, not uh, to say that this could happen at the EU level, given that the EU uh, does not have the same federal structure as, as Canada, but there are ways uh, in which it can be done. Um, the second category uh, through the second category of policies or mechanism av available to, um, to the Commission or to national um, national member states to counterbalance uh, or to compensate for, uh, for the impact of uh, carbon pricing is via the uh, introduction of countervailing uh, policies. Um, Professor Pollitt um, mentioned it uh, briefly in the first debate um, and uh, it was commented on by uh, some of the panelists. Um, in fact, some of the policies at the EU and at the member states level uh, already have um, some countervailing uh, effect. Uh, for example, energy efficiency, um, which uh, led to energy, uh, sorry, the energy efficiency directive, which led to uh, energy efficiency improvements in appliances um, for households, um, has led to uh, a reduction uh, in uh, households' electricity bills, uh, for example, compared to what they might have paid under a higher carbon price scenario without energy efficiency uh, policies in place. Uh, finally, the, the, the last point here, um, and I guess this is a, a political uh, point, uh, more so than the first two uh, items here, um, timing of the move is important. Now, um, the urgency of the, the climate problem that we face uh, means that we don't really have the luxury of time to wait, um, but it will be less politically problematic if um, the new uh, carbon pricing charge or mechanism is introduced in a time where um, fossil fuel prices are um, say, lower or benign for, for households. Um, but no one, uh, certainly not me, nor uh, the European Commission, nor anyone else, I believe, has a crystal ball. And, and this is obviously uh, uh, tricky. Uh, we can't exclude the fact that we might be caught by surprise um, by um, a sudden rise in, in, uh, in fuel prices um, at the same time as the, the scheme is being rolled out. Now, um, quickly, before, before I conclude, um, a word of um, how redistributional uh, policies and mechanisms have worked in practice in, in the case of California. Um, so 
there is very simply, there are two ways in which uh, the California scheme redistributes the revenue raised from uh, allowance auction. One is through um, um, funding of uh, what they call weatherization uh, programs, uh, among other things, which is essentially um, programs that uh, improve the energy efficiency of, of, of buildings um, and which are especially targeted at uh, what they call priority populations. Um, and in the program so far, in, in the, over the lifetime of the program, 57% of um, the revenue that's been raised has been uh, dedicated to, um, uh, to uh, these, type of, uh, these type of programs targeting um, more vulnerable uh, populations. Um, secondly, uh, households and, and, and small businesses, uh, according to some definition, also get what they call carbon credits, um, and which essentially come as a rebate on um, as a rebate on their bill, and uh, the value of which depends on the actual price of uh, the allowance auction in the market. So, um, the, the one thing I would add here is that yes, um, the the a carbon the cap and trade scheme is volatile. Um, is more volatile than a tax, uh, but this is not uh, to say that this volatility cannot be offset um, either by uh, proper hedging by industries themselves or uh, by um, a suitably engineered uh, mechanism uh, by the public authority. Um, Yes, yeah, so this is for the California example, and um, it is, uh, I mean, the illustration we've chosen here, but there are other schemes uh, which have developed in the recent years that could be, uh, that could be looked at. Um, and let me, let, me conclude, uh, let me conclude here with some reminders of, of both what I just said and uh, what's been said in the, in the previous time. Um, it is clear, and I think everybody agrees on that, that uh, getting to net zero by uh, 2050 um, and uh, achieving a 55% reduction uh, by 2030 requires a strengthening of um, existing climate policy, uh, the EU climate policy regime. Um, secondly, the standards-based policies have had an impact um, we are uh, never are we saying nor are we suggesting that uh, standards based policies haven't had an effect on um, uh, emissions in specific sectors of the EU economy. Um, but the problem is they do not cap the aggregate growth uh, of emissions. So even if on a you know per appliance basis or uh, per car basis, they have um, triggered improvements uh, in emissions rate, um, the, the overall uh, emissions, um, so, the, so, so many appliances by uh, the emissions rate hasn't, uh, hasn't uh, plateaued uh, over the last uh, 30 years. Um, in fact, in the, in the transport sector, it has, uh, it has increased. Um, which might have uh, they might have fell um, fall, fallen more recently, but over the the, the, the thirty years uh, leading to twenty twenty, they they have increased substantially. Which leads me to say that the the EU extension, we are absolutely clear that the extension of the EU ETS needs to happen in a, a way that is consistent with the EU's objective. So net zero by 2050 and minus 55% by 2030. And we are also absolutely clear that um, distributional impacts need to be addressed. Um, but again, I would emphasize that we need to, the, the answer to the distributional impact problem um, is to get smarter and quick at um, addressing them, not necessarily to suggest um, an alternative which might overall uh, be uh, more costly and, and prove and make the problem in a way uh, more tricky. Um, finally, um, as as, uh, as we've said, uh, the, the EU extension uh, could be 
a dynamic commitment device, so it could provide a, a long-term, uh, fairly powerful, uh, powerful signal. And um, we need to keep in mind that uh, we only have a set carbon budget from now to 2050, um, and we need a tool that is effective at tackling that, or a tool or a set of tools working in combinations that could um, help, us, uh, help us get there. Um, with this, uh, I thank you very much for your time and uh, I'm looking forward to discussion. Many thanks, many thanks, uh, uh, Doctor. Um, I think it's it's been a very very interesting uh, presentation and also showcasing the examples of California and other countries how this could be done because this is also important to discuss. Um, now uh, I think it's very uh, very timely to to go now back to our panelists and I would like to start with Monique Goyens. Monique. Um, of course, we want to hear from uh, from you on uh, you know an overall reaction to this particular part that is dealing with distributional effects. And you know, I I like to also ask you, as uh, one of the leading voices uh, in, in Brussels and uh, also defending consumers, are you getting more calls from all the national consumer associations that you represent in Brussels about distributional effects in general? for any policy, any climate related policy. Uh, and um, is, do you feel like uh, this issue is gaining ground on, on the consumer's agenda or you think that we're not still there? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the questions, uh, Massimo. And thank you also for allowing me to uh, bring the consumer perspective. And I just see that Beatrice has left. I hope it's not a bad signal uh, that uh, they don't care about the consumer perspective, but uh, Pete has already made the consumer perspective quite clear in the first panel. Um, first of all, I mean, to answer already in part your, your question, um, over the last two years, sustain uh, and even a little bit more as far as um, cars are concerned but sustainable mobility and sustainable housing has have become top priorities for for Berg, and this is on request of our members so uh, our members in the in the member states in the countries on the ground uh, are really more and more aware that they need to be part of the conversation and that they need consumer organizations need to be part of the solutions because it has a huge impact all the policy decisions that are being taken have a huge impact on people and so what I would also like to say is that I might be a little bit blunt and I might be a little bit less prudent than Pete, uh, what he has said uh, in the first panel. But uh, I mean, my feedback comes from a daily context that my members have with real people and from my daily context with real policymakers and how they are under pressure and how they are being captured by different interests to take political decisions. So just so that you know that. Um, to be, as I said, a little bit straightforward, from the consumer perspective, extending ETS to road transport and to building is a very, very bad idea. It's a high risk, low reward measure. Uh, and I will explain um, to you why in a, few in, uh, in a few seconds, but I wanted to react and I'm really, um, let's say, uh, not frustrated, but I can understand that uh, Beatrice is very, um, very busy, but I wanted to respond to what she said about carbon pricing. And I wanted to reassure everybody, as a consumer organization, we are not against carbon pricing per se. It can be a good tool. In fact, consumers need to be pushed towards more sustainable lifestyles. And price signals and carbon pricing signals are part of the toolbox that policymakers have in order to push people into, 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 into um, let's say, more less carbon intensive uh, lifestyles. But we still believe that ETS is not the right tool. And uh, there can be much more uh, effective ways of using price signals. And one of the more, more effective ways could be to clean up the existing uh, mechanisms that already exist. For example, in the energy taxation directive, uh, when you look at how um, the advantage that fossil fuel has over cleaner alternatives, this is not the right price signal. So if you would correct that price signal, that would make it make already uh, would have already a, an important uh, impact on more sustainable lifestyles. So now, why are we against an extension of ETS? It has already been mentioned, but I, I, I just repeated and I repeated in our words and with our analysis. 
um, the extension would have severe impacts on household and in, in particular on low income households um, because uh, you know, moving on the road and heating or cooling your house is a, an important part of the household budget, like uh, Geoffroy already mentioned, but it's more important even for the lower income households. You should not forget that we, between 35 and 50 million of households are struggling to heat their homes in Europe. And that what, those are figures before the, the COVID crisis. It can, of course, even increase substantially in the years to come. And as it has already been mentioned, um, this is unfair against those lower, less affluent households because um, roads and road um, or transport expenses and uh, heating expenses are a higher part of their budget. But also, and that has been not so much mentioned today, is they cannot afford the investment of going to the more energy efficient alternatives. So it is, this means, in fact, extending the ETS would lead to lock in people into unsustainable lifestyles at a very high price. This is not what is the aim of the policy. And that means that uh, it is against the, um, zero, the net zero target. It is against the just transition vision. And it is also against the narrative, the, the, the mainstream commission narrative, which is about leaving no one behind and having an inclusive policy, certainly when it comes uh, to uh, the Green Deal. Now, I think that the report uh, that has been uh, presented today uh, acknowledge, acknowledges the, the problem, the negative uh, distributional impact. However, uh, can I say um, a little bit provocatively, that's uh, a little bit my job at this panel, isn't it? Uh, that it takes a quite bold assumption that there will be mitigating measure, measures. Now, let me be a little bit the reality check here. That would mean if you have mitigating measures, you, you, you mentioned the California measures, which I found very interesting to, to hear huh? and, and to listen to, but that would mean that the, reven the extra revenues that would be received by um, authorities um, from the extension of ETS would be redistributed to the citizens. But I can tell you, there will be a high competition to capture that additional revenue for very legitimate reasons, be it the pandemic workers, be it innovative industries, and we fear from our experience when it comes about advocacy strength, uh, that uh, consumers will lose out. And the, uh, that money will not necessarily, from the consumer perspective, go to those that would need it most. Um, so another assumption also is that uh, ETS would be uh, combined with other policy measures. Uh, so sector-specific uh, measures could be uh, combined with the ETS. And there, while we believe that the Commission might indeed uh, uh, stick to its guns because it has to roll out the high ambition of the Green Deal, we believe that at member state level, there will be important negotiation uh, dynamics and power plays that where we will end up with much less ambitious sector specific measures than would be expected and that would need to be uh, put in place in order to mitigate the negative impact of the um, of the extension of, of the ETS. So uh, we are quite um, we are quite there um, hesitant to, to, to believe in, in positive outcomes there. And as a, as a final remark, so as a concluding remark, uh, then I leave the floor to Jude, uh, if, if you agree, Massimo, of course, uh, we are not at all in favor of a, scenar of a scenario that would combine ETS extensions with measures that mitigate its downsides we be, because it's too improbable that that will happen. We just uh, recommend strongly resisting the extension of ETS and to invest into concentrating, focusing on sector specific measures, such as a car CO2 uh, targets that would be much more uh, stringent or uh, energy efficiency targets that would be stronger. And we believe that that would be uh, the, the best way forward. And if I can just before uh, I, I, I stop, uh, maybe um, answer a, um, a statement that was made by Geoffroy just uh, a, a few minutes ago uh, about the negative impact of compliant, of higher compliance um, uh, costs, for example, on the second hand markets. There are years of experience now that do contra contradict that risk. That doesn't exist. We have, we have ourselves commissioned several studies about the total cost of ownership, where we compare the total cost of ownership of, let's say, traditional combustion engines with low emission vehicles and with electric cars. And we see that uh, in a very, very uh, near future, 
um, and certainly on second-hand markets, uh, the, the total cost of ownership of the low emission vehicles and on the electric cars is lower than the um, traditional combustion engine. So I think that there, it, it might be in, important to have a more, uh, let's say, um, um, balanced and nuanced uh, perspective on the, the compliance costs. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Monique. Uh, that, that has been very, very refreshing. And uh, I didn't expect less from you uh, to be very, very sharp, uh, very accurate, very precise on your, on your arguments. And I, I think uh, it's also why we have invited you to tell us the reality, to tell us what you have heard from your, your members, your, your consumer associations. And, and I think, of course, uh, this report opens to a lot of discussions on what we could theoretically do, what could potentially work. But there is also, as you said, uh, the realities and the practice that has to be assessed. So I thank you for for highlighting that. And we will make sure that uh, Beatrice will, will get the, the recorded video so she can have access to your to your comments. But um, now uh, you did well. I call you Jude. Uh, now it's uh, it's your it's your moment to to tell us a bit more uh, about your perspectives from what you're hearing. But also um, there has been some questions and comments so far on on the issue of carbon leakage, which of course um, it's let's say a different side of the coin compared to distributional effects, but it's still back to the citizens, back to the workers, back to real people that uh, they don't understand maybe the, the whole dynamics of ETS, but the moment that they will hit their uh, daily economies, they will ask why. And, and at that moment, it will be difficult to, to manage the situation. So uh, could you tell us a bit more your views about the overall debate? And if you can tell us uh, more about this idea of, okay, how uh, the extension of ETS can also have an impact on uh, potential carbon leakage. Yeah, of course, it's really a pleasure to, to be part of this um, event as well, and uh, particularly to follow um, Monique, because uh, as she was speaking, I cut big swathes of what I was going to say um, out of, out of uh, my, uh, my notes, um, because your study really is quite provocative um, when you look at the reality on the ground across Europe. And um, I represent um, 7 million workers in Europe's manufacturing, mining and energy sectors. Um, and industrial Europe, we have uh, taken, we took the decision um, already uh, previously several years ago that we are fully committed to the objective of carbon neutrality uh, by 2050. But and it's a big but, it must be accompanied by a fair, just transition. And that has to be a fair, just transition for the workers that we represent and also for the communities that we live in. And, um, and so in that context, we need a European policy um, uh, framework which uh, provides that framework for a just transition on an equal par with the agenda around climate action. Because it's only through having that equality of the um, policy framework that we will guarantee the social acceptance of a, an ambitious climate agenda um, in Europe. And I think, you know, it's been referred to, I think Pete was quite eloquent uh, in the first panel about the social acceptance dimension. I don't think in the current situation in Europe that we can underestimate uh, the volatility of public opinion also about some of these policies. And I think if you, you do underestimate that volatility um, in putting forward policy proposals, you risk more than just those policy proposals. There's, these are fundamental challenges to um, our, our European integration and um, cooperation at EU, particularly in some uh, key countries and regions. So for us, the ETS um, has a, a vital role to play within that policy framework. Um, it's key uh, for the acceler acceleration of EU decarbonisation, but we shouldn't see it as a silver bullet or a panacea for every sector, for every situation. Um, it's just one of the policy tools uh, that we have. And we also, and I think that was important um, that Pete fleshed that out in the first panel, have to recognise that the ETS has been relatively successful for power 
um, emissions, but actually for the last decade we've seen a stagnation in terms of emission reduction in energy intensive industries. Um, and so we have to think about why that is, because there are millions of jobs um, in these industries and uh, the policy framework um, is crucial. The idea of uh, and the debate so far has all been about putting more into the pot, more into the ETS uh, framework, without actually looking at what's happening within the existing ETS. And the implications of adding road transport and um, buildings and heating into the ETS for us is a really extremely bad idea. We're completely against. Um, I mean, I, I think Monique is blunt, but I'm I'm willing to give her a competition in in bluntness. Um, we have to understand why those emissions have stagnated. Part of it is the surplus and the low price of um, allowances. But a big part of it is exactly that question that you raised, Maximo, about carbon leakage and about the, um, the conditions um, and the uncertainty related to investment in Europe in energy intensive industries. And we also have to see where we are in terms of our path to 2050. This decade, and in fact, the next five years, are absolutely crucial for the existing ETS sectors. We have um, a, a moment, an investment moment, where the investments which are made in the next few years will determine our trajectory up till 2050, because these industries have long investment cycles. And effectively, we're only one investment cycle um, now away from 2050. So we have to think very carefully about shifting the policy framework in a period in which that investment cycle is actually being made. Um, and um, if we look at, um, for example, uh, the um, the impact that it would potentially have on on prices, the inclusion of road transport and and buildings in the ETS to get the right price signal um, in the road transport uh, to change consumer behaviour in terms of transport or in terms of building, the price would have to be considerably higher than our energy intensive industries are able to cope with today without um, in an enormous framework around carbon leakage. Um, so if you're looking at a price signal of 200 um, euros uh, per tonne of CO2, which is what some studies say you would need uh, for consumer changes in terms of uh, the new sectors, um, then that put into the context of the steel industry, put into the context of the cement industry, is a recipe for deindustrialization in Europe and in particular regions of Europe, rapid deindustrialization, which will have absolutely enormous social consequences uh, for, um, for our economy, for society, um, and so on. Equally, if the price is the price of the current ETS, there will be no impact on consumer um, decisions. A price of um, 30, 35 euros is about six cents on a euro, you know, six euro cents on a litre of fuel. That will hurt some um, consumers, the poorest, uh, but it will have very little impact in terms of consumer change. Um, so I absolutely agree with uh, Monique's point that this is bad also in terms of trying to shift consumers' um, behaviour and, and decisions. So in and and, um, and as I said, uh, at the moment, we have this moment where we need a reliability, a predictability of the framework to ensure that we get the investment in new steel mills, in new uh, cement plants, in new crackers in the chemicals industry, and so on. So please don't mess with the ETS. It's only 15 years old that it's been running. It's starting to bed down, if you already start to jig everything around again, you create enormous unpredictability uh, for those who are already um, included. Some people in that context then say, well, we should create a separate ETS uh, for road transport and building. And there again, we see that there's an argument, uh, we hear it being built, a separate ETS plus standards. We've, we've heard it um, uh, today in the discussion. And there, the obstacle for us is the social um, the social impact. I 
absolutely subscribed to the point that Monique made about uh, the fact that your whole model depends on the political will of member state governments to put in place the social policy measures and the redistribution necessary uh, to actually alleviate that social dimension. There was mention in your presentation, uh, Geoffroy, of uh, the Just Transition Fund. This again is something which we increasingly hear as this kind of silver bullet policy. At the moment, the Just Transition Fund is about um, 17.5 billion euros and it is aimed at coal dependent regions, primarily coal dependent and carbon dependent regions. To give you an idea of the actual economic need in those regions, we have something like 40 regions at European level which are uh, targeted by the Just Transition Fund and this 17.5 billion euros. In Germany, the coal phase out on focused on four to five regions has 40 billion euros in terms of investment. The Just Transition Fund is already stretched to its absolute um, limits and adding on more responsibilities will actually reduce the impact of that money still further in the communities that it's destined for and where it's really, really needed in terms of um, uh, the transition, the phase out of coal and uh, the transition um, for those coal dependent um, regions. So we have to have a joined up approach in this policy framework um, and trying to, to latch more issues onto existing funds is not, um, is not a way of, of, of doing that. But in terms of the, um, the kind of separate ETS, um, if you like, um, what we're really concerned about is this, um, the impact on the lower end of the income spectrum. And uh, to add to, not to repeat what Monique has already said, but to add a little bit of colour also to that, I think you have to think about low income workers and the choices and the opportunities that different people have across Europe in terms of what, um, uh, what their consumer choices are. If you're a worker on atypical working, an atypical working time regime, you are much, much more likely to be dependent on individual mobility. And many of those workers are also poorly paid. If you then start to add on the burden of higher prices, you see this um, multiple impact that you laid out in your first uh, presentation in terms of the distributional effect. That has to be much better understood if you're um, going to address uh, these, these, um, uh, these impacts. Because if we look at what we have today in terms of national measures around taxation, for example, incentives, in fact, many of them are aimed at middle income or upper income parts of the population. Um, incentives for electric vehicles, for example, and, and other incentives target much higher income groups in reality. Um, and the, the challenge is that we are adding a punitive um, uh, cost onto the lowest income and giving gifts, if you like, to higher income, increasing the inequality in our societies. So this whole um, area needs to be looked at in um, a lot more detail. Or we, and I, I won't reiterate the point, but he, he made it well, or we face um, the rise of potentially of a Europe-wide uh, gilet jaune movement in opposition to Brussels and Brussels imposing um, increased costs in terms of fuel, um, ho housing fuel and, um, and transport fuel. And for us, and here two, two last points, there, there are alternatives. Um, why not think a little bit further out of the box? Why are we always playing with our existing policy instruments? Um, we think that we should be talking about massive investment across Europe in public transport and public transport infrastructure, um, really strong and ambitious renovation programmes in social housing um, and linking it to very strong um, environmental uh, criteria. Um, carbon taxation uh, targeting non-essential expensive goods 
actually targeting those who have money rather than punitive taxation targeting targeting uh, those uh, that don't. Um, investment support schemes, zero interest loans and technical assistance for lower middle income households who want to go for deep renovation, stronger standards for new heating and cooling equipment, stricter rules for company cars and fleet cars. These are all alternatives uh, that could be put on the table. And my last um, last yeah, point sorry, is... Sorry, I, I uh, need to interrupt you to give yeah, a bit too. I, I just want to make one very, very small uh, point at the end about ETS revenues. Uh, because it's been raised a couple of times. We know they're redistributed um, largely at national level. Um, we, we like the idea of earmarking more at European level. Um, that has to be said, the Modernisation Fund and other initiatives are exactly, exactly that. But one area where we're very concerned is that the ETS is being claimed by multiple uh, politicians and stakeholders at European level for different goals. And increasingly, the ETS revenues are being linked to the repaying of the recovery plan and uh, the COVID recovery package. If everybody is going for the same money, um, we know that those social policies and the just transition will be the bottom of the pile unless there's real political will to make sure that they're not. So I come back to my first point to conclude. We need climate policy and the social policy to be on equal level. As I think, uh, if I, I go back to your survey, 32% of the people that replied, that's what they said. The people that I worry about, Maximo, are the 16% who replied to your study, who said that there is no importance in addressing distributional uh, issues. That's actually the most concerning thing for me, because what we're hearing from um, many of the policy debates is that those 16% are very influent influential in the European uh, policy debate in this area. So uh, thank you. I'm sorry if I ran over. No, we okay, feel very you. passionately about this uh, debate. Which we love that. We love that, Jude. And I think uh, in that sense, we all agree that we need to put our passion on this debate because it's too important just to leave it for a normal, let's say, flow. And and I, I like to, yeah, uh, on the on the survey, I think what, what you're saying, it's very interesting because I think in the two panels, nobody is rejecting the uh, risk of distributional effects. I think we all agree on that. Then, of course, there is a question of priorities. How important are distributional effects and how those will shape the design of any policy and the combination of policies? And then we have another debate, which is how we make sure that the governance of the EU will work the moment we have some money or funding knowing that the experience sometimes is not great, the practice is not great. So there are multiple layer of debates. And I, I'd like to maybe start with one question. I know we, we have only seven minutes left, but um, uh, give the opportunity to Geoffroy and to Michael a bit to react, because here we see, yes, uh, let's do it. And then we say, no, be careful, it's gonna be very dangerous. And uh, what is your reflection when you hear from consumers and from, let's say, the union side uh, to Michael and, and Geoffroy, be careful, this could be very bad. We will have more gilets jaunes. Um, thank you, Massimo. Um, thank you, Monique and, and Jude. Thanks very much. Um, so there's, there's a lot that's been said, um, and I thank you for that. Um, I, I mean, you know, it's, it's, I really enjoy getting the, getting the, the perspective and the um, and and the opinion uh, from uh, groups um, and strides of society that uh, I might not have access to all the time, um, but so I think um, and thankfully there's overlap a bit of overlap in in what you said uh, and between the two of you. So I think one uh, one thing to say is that. Um, by no way are we uh, suggesting that uh, distributional impacts are not daunting, right? Um, the problem is uh, getting to net zero by 2050 is going to be um, uh, is going to be daunting, regardless of how we uh, try to achieve it. So I I do not share the view, or I do not believe um, that it is a case um, that. Uh, distributional impacts uh, arising from the UETS are more daunting 
um, than, um, than the ones that might arise from alternative, alternative policies. This, this means that we need to um, be pretty, uh, I would say, smart but we, we, or, or committed to actually finding ways in which we truly address these distributional impacts, both at the EU level and at the national member states level. Um, and I don't believe we have done that uh, properly or to the best uh, we can so far, partly because um, given that the climate policy was less stringent than what it's calling to be, um, there was less pressure to you know, redistribute in the scales and scope that will be needed by a net zero target in 2050. Um, I think, also, uh, I, I mean, one thing that comes to mind is um, Jude used the word punitive charges or taxes on, uh, on, on some consumers or industries. Um, I understand they might be perceived as such, um, but I, do, I mean, but this is not what fossil fuel taxes are. They're not meant to, you know, bury down a whole a part of, uh, of, uh, of society or a part of consumers. Um, I think on that side, on that front, um, there needs to be uh, a, m a much clearer and neater, uh, not only design of distributional imp uh, of uh, mechanisms that alleviate distributional impacts, but also a much uh, better marketing at uh, the revenue uh, that uh, consumers might get from uh, the, from these uh, from these mechanisms. Now, I know politically it is difficult, uh, and I do know, uh, I am aware of the, the particular difficulty that the EU setting presents, because um, EU might get the, the EU might get the blame, national member states uh, might uh, um, sort of come to the rescue, and there are tricky uh, interactions and interplay there. Um, one uh, related to that, uh, I think, I can also say uh, I've, I've heard, uh, why don't we do it uh, you know, via taxation? Um, and in particular, at the EU level, it would be the Energy Taxation Directive, which provides a floor for uh, the taxation of uh, some uh, or a wide range of, of energy vectors uh, across member states. Um, the problem with that, I believe, is that we, I mean, although taxes per se are more predictable, although I would like to put um, quotation marks there, um, this, I believe, that, I don't believe the ETD would be adjusted in a way that would um, uh, provide something, anything else but a floor uh, to uh, the uh, price applied to carbon content of fuels, um, and as a result, m might uh, lack the homogeneity that an EU ETS uh, would provide to uh, to the EU in terms of in terms of price signal. Um, I mean, there are many things I can say, or I, I could say, I don't know, uh, I'm, I'm turning to yeah, Massimo here. I'm sorry, um, yeah, because we are running out of time. Maybe, maybe Michael, you want to add something and, and Pete, and maybe the last question, because we're getting to 4 p.m. Okay, um, I thank you very much for that. I, I think one thing I want to say is our current climate policy will not get us to net zero. So something radical is required. And I think my one thought I would inject here is we, we, we're not on course to get our climate targets, but we know lots about poverty alleviation. OK, and so don't just think poverty alleviation is about energy prices. It's actually about raising people's income and the use of general taxation. And actually, we know a lot about how to do that smartly in Europe. So let's not necessarily confuse the two. And, and the other thing I would say is consumers and citizens are the same people. It's the same people who are, you know, are demanding that we do something about climate. And, and Pete pointed that out. It's young people overwhelmingly want us to do something about climate. And the fact is, people can't have these, you know, two hats. They've, it's the same person who has to realise, well, my energy bill has to go up. And um, I, I, if I support climate policy, and we need to... You know, we need to stop deluding ourselves that somehow somebody else is going to pay for climate change. We need to use conventional redistribution mechanisms within our societies, which are highly political, in order to meet our climate targets. And there's no getting away from that. We can't hide the cost of climate change.
Yes, um, I think you know we we really need to wrap up, and and it's it's unfortunate, but that's time. I, Monique, uh, very short, and maybe then a conclusion. Two very quick things. First of all, in the next version of your academic report, it is very easy to have access to both Jude's organization and mine. Just get in touch with us and include us in your analysis. And second, what I would like to say is that we don't have a long window of opportunity. We don't have a century ahead of us. You will need the people on board because they will need to change their lifestyles. The way we eat, the way we move, the way we travel, the way we heat our homes. Better have us on board. By, by, I mean, it's not about penalizing or punitive, but if you don't take account of their behavioral biases and of their, their capacity to, to be part of that conversation and of that changing lifestyle, it will be a failure. And we cannot afford that failure. Thank you. We'll stop here. Okay, thank you, Monique. Pete, last... Uh... Thank you. Thank you for the last comment. Um, I, so I agree with Michael um, uh, that the current policy framework uh, won't do the job and it does need to be improved. And, and indeed, as Geoffrey said, 2050 is daunting. Um, but what it means is that we need to innovate rapidly across all sectors. And the idea that the ETS is the most efficient to way to do that because you can do certain things later in other sectors is a total fallacy. We need to do everything as fast as possible now in order to drive down the costs so that we can do it at minimal cost. Um, and while doing that, we have to take care of all of society. We need to make sure that people don't get left by the wayside. We need to make sure that we don't exacerbate energy poverty. And I think it comes down to uh, a fundamental question, is do we trust each other to take care of each other, or do we want to be ruled by markets? Okay, thank you. Thank you for, well, that sentence. I, I have to thank you all of you for this second uh, panel. Uh, we see, we see, we can now <laughs> confirm that there are different views uh, about how to approach it. It's a very complex task for the commission. I think we will need to continue this conversation, but there is one clear conclusion that I think we can all agree. Distribution of effects has been there. They will continue to be there. And the connection between climate policies and the fast decarbonization will imply a much more sophisticated assessment uh, and mitigation of potential distribution effects all across Europe. And it will be a huge task for all of us in no matter which role we are. So um, I'd like to say again, thank you. Uh, I think we make this kind of survey was a bit black and white much more gray in many different aspects, in many different elements. And uh, what I would like to do is to invite all of you and everybody has been follow us to go to our website, sir.eu, read the paper and continue to think about this. And uh, I think for the next, uh, next upcoming weeks and months, you will see now uh, after this uh, conclusion, the different events that we'll be organizing uh, within SER. So with that, I'd like to thank you again. Have an excellent end of the afternoon, and I hope to see you around. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.